let's go this morning. Um, I want to pick up on part three of friendship evangelism. Uh, we have one more week after this week on, on friendship evangelism that's really going to set us up for moving into uh, putting these things into practice. Um, and we're all basing this out of Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. We know this is the Great Commission. It says, then Jesus, or then the 11 disciples, went away from Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed to them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This was a time where Jesus was, was getting ready to leave, and he said, now, I need you to do something. I need you to make disciples. Now, w that is one of the most intimidating. That's where we become the scared goat. Ah! All right, because all of a sudden he said, how can I make a disciple? I don't know enough. I don't know enough to make a disciple. So the challenge is, and, we, and some of us have gone through this before, the challenge is, every one of us has a story. Jesus has done something for you. Yes? Whew, they are still alive. Okay. Jesus has done something for you. The question is, can you tell it? Can you tell what Jesus has done for you? In, in business and in marketing, we call them an elevator speech. If you've got a person that steps in the elevator with you and they're going to travel five floors, can you share Christ with them from five, the fifth floor to the first floor? If you've rehearsed your speech, if you've rehearsed your story, if you've rehearsed what Jesus has done for you, sure, that's easy. But if you wait until you walk into the elevator, that's like never studying the sales material and trying to sell a product. Somebody says, what's in it? I don't know. It's a pretty bottle. But see, that's so many times what we try to do with our relationship with Christ is we say, you need Jesus. And they say, why? And we go, ah. at that point, we become intimidated. We become afraid. And Jesus said, listen, God has already given me all power under heaven and earth. And if I'm in you, guess what you have? All power under heaven and earth. So what is there to be afraid of? What's the worst thing they're going to do? Throat punch you? Nah, probably not. Most people aren't going to. They may be upset with you. They may tell you to shut up. But most generally, they're going to be at least respectful enough to listen. And if they've listened, I've then planted a seed. I've then planted that seed. I may not get to harvest that seed, but somebody will. But it's my responsibility to plant the seed. See, we have discovered, if you will, a lifeboat. We'll tell you that, that this church and this building is a lifeboat. And we sing lifeboat songs. You know, we have our kumbaya. We're in the lifeboat. We're comfortable. Everything's great. But there are people around us that are drowning. And we're not willing to put them into our lifeboat. We're afraid that it'll mess up the lifeboat. I might not have the same seat in the lifeboat I had before. It may be a little bit more uncomfortable in the lifeboat. And we're like, huh? Now, understand this. This is what happened with the Titanic. The Titanic, we know the story. Greatest boat ever built, they said. It was the biggest one at its time. And it was unsinkable. They didn't take into consideration that boat iceberg problem. All right, so they hit an iceberg. The boat's sinking. Now, the truth is, there was not enough life jackets nor lifeboats for everybody. And 1,517 people died. Every lifeboat was designed to carry 70 adults. And every lifeboat had room in it. There was not a single lifeboat that was full. 
But what was happening is they were row, row, row your boat. People all around them screaming, but they weren't willing to turn around and go back to pick up the people in the water that were dying. So there were hundreds of people that died senselessly. And we say, oh, those people in that rowboat, that's where we are. We're in the rowboat that we call the kingdom of God. And there are people around us that are desperate to be saved, and we row right past them. We don't stop. We don't turn around and say, hey, we got room in our boat, and reach over and pull them up into the boat. We don't take the time to do that. We have to look at the situation around us, assess the situation around us, assess the risk. What is the biggest risk of sharing your faith? Ridicule, maybe? The person may never talk to you again? Thank you, Jesus. So maybe you should start witnessing to the person you like least. I don't know. But simple fact of the matter is, you are already in a secure situation. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There is eternal life in you. But we walk past people that are drowning every day, not willing to reach down and grab a hold of them. One of the hardest things I see all the time is Christians that say, I have no friends. Here's the reason so many people and so many Christians don't have any friends. Proverbs 18, 22. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. It's not up there yet? Okay, Michael's dragging on me. A man who has friends must show himself friendly. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. See, so many Christians today have no friends because we're so focused on us that we do no outreach. You know, we talked about in these steps of going, this is a step that says you have to look out around you and be willing to reach out and start to become a friend to somebody. So I want you to think about your last week and people that you were in contact with that you loosely, and not even your close, that you loosely call friends. Okay, got them in your head? How many of them do not know Christ? Just, I'm not asking you to tell me. I just do the math in your head. Okay? Out of all those people that you came in contact with week, this week that you would call friends, acquaintances, how many of them don't know Christ? That is the number of times that you missed helping somebody into the lifeboat. And we don't have to do that by thumping the Bible. We don't have to scream at them. We don't have to quote scripture to them. We don't have to do anything. What do we have to do? We have to be a friend. That's it. Just show yourself friendly. And you say, well, I'm busy. I don't have a lot of time. How many of you ate lunch every day this week? Unless otherwise fasting or working, you had lunch this week. Yes? Okay. Guess what? You had time to talk to somebody. See, I'm, I'm one of those guys, Ben, I like to have lunch by myself. I'm like, I have a moment. And, and I, I was studying this and looking at this, and, and, and I looked at it yesterday as I was sitting, I was driving back from, uh, from the meeting, and, and I'm saying, how many times this week did I have lunch by myself? <sighs> Every day. How many people in my workplace do I know that need Christ? I know eight. I could have spent time with five of them this week, and maybe I could have doubled up. I could have re reached every person in my workplace that I know that does not know the Lord this week alone. And I had to go, oops. God, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm more comfortable in my lifeboat because there's room to stretch out. I can stretch my legs. I can relax. And God, you're asking me to make my lifeboat uncomfortable. You're asking me to bring people into my personal space. And God says, you have none. He's like reminding me with a couple weeks ago, we preached on Zacchaeus. 
Jesus is walking through a crowd of people who are tugging and pulling on him, but yet he still saw the one in the tree and said, hey, let's go do lunch. Oh, by the way, we're going to your house. Wow. Even in all that busyness and all those things, he still took. So did Jesus demonstrate Proverbs for us? Did he show himself friendly? Absolutely. What did he get from it? A free lunch? No, he got a friend. He got a guy that was willing to accept him, that was willing to step in to everything that he had. You see, we cannot be as selfish as the people in the lifeboats from the Titanic. We've got to be willing to reach over the side and pull them up. Next week, I'm going to tell you about an evangelist that was on the Titanic. Most people don't know about him. I didn't know about him until yesterday. I started looking him up. And when you look at the line of people that was touched, because even though he was sinking, and even though he died, he never stopped sharing his faith. Never stop sharing his faith. You see, there's no reason, no excuse that we are not sharing our faith other than we're a screaming goat. Ah! That's it. I can see people Googling now. You know, it's, it's hilarious. It's the funniest thing you've ever seen. Walk up behind us and go, boo. And it just, ah! Stiff falls over. Just don't Google it now. Okay, we'll, we'll do that later. All right, so in this process, we've got to look forward. We have to reach out to these people. We have to be friendly. We have to get them into the lifeboat. We have to share with them because if they're really your friends, you care whether or not they go to hell. It matters to you. When you look at people that you come into contact with, it matters to me the condition of their soul because I don't want to see them go to an eternal judgment. I haven't met anybody in my life, even people that I don't like, that I want to see go through that. If you don't know what that's going to be like, you need to read your scriptures a little stronger. Because it is eternal torment to be separated from the presence of God forever. Never again having the opportunity to step into the presence of God. So, we've talked the last few weeks about reaching out to people, about uh, sharing our faith, about all of these things. So, they get saved. They come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now what? We have a new, bless you, we have a new babe in Christ. So, when you uh, have a new baby... And you're bringing this new baby home from the hospital. Michael and Krista bringing Melody Jo home. Melody Jo, welcome to our family. We got, we're, we got things to do. So the refrigerator's there. And uh, you need to read this manual because it'll tell you how to turn the TV on and all. And we'll be back in a little bit. We'll see you next week. And they leave. What happens to Melody Jo? She's going to die. Because what does a baby need? Baby needs to be fed. A baby needs to be protected. A baby needs to be taught right from wrong. A baby needs love. Right? These are things that the baby needs in baby's life. Well, what happens so many times is a person comes to the altar or we lead someone to Christ and we say, here, read the book of John and we'll see you next week. What chance do they have of survival? Because they've just come into a world that they don't know anything about. We can use all of our isms that we want to. We talk about praise and worship. We talk about anointing with oil. We talk about communion and they're sitting there saying, never heard of it. What do you mean? It's like taking a baby that was just born and setting it in the middle of the house and saying, everything you need's here, just go get it. And we leave them. It's not wise. So once 
You've led someone to Christ. Now the work starts. I had somebody ask me the other day, how come you don't deer hunt a lot anymore? Well, because I'm afraid I'm going to shoot one. Because you know what happens when you shoot a deer? Work. Somebody, Michael, has to come get that deer, skin that deer, get that deer off the hill, and then somebody's got to cut it up. And somebody, work starts. It was fun shooting it. It was fun hunting. I enjoy that. But after that's done, now I have to be responsible for it. The work starts. It's called being an ethical hunter. Well, getting people to know Jesus and witnessing to them and getting them saved is a blast. But guess what happens? The work starts. Because Jesus didn't say, go into all the world, preach the gospel, and get them saved. What do you say, Ben? Make disciples. <sighs> Mature them. Help them grow. Help them go in too. So that means it's going to cost me something. One of the greatest examples of this is step five when we say look after. Look after. Let's go over to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 starting at verse 25 is the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan. And as we read this, I want you to stop and evaluate your life and see if you find yourself in one of these people. All right? Now, uh, be honest with yourself. Because honestly, there are times I find myself in one of these all the time. I may not be the one. It just changes for me. There's times that I'm one of each. So it says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, him being Jesus, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Good theological question. So we say lawyer there, we're looking at a theologian. This is somebody that's astute in the word of God. So Jesus answered him and said this, what is written in the law? And how do you interpret it? How do you read it? So I love Jesus. This is kind of the teaching style that I've modeled. modeled. He answers a question with a question. They're called locators. So he answered, he being the lawyer, and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, You get an A. You passed. He says, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, So who is my neighbor? Whew. So that means uh, my neighbors, okay, Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones. They live directly next door to me. Those are my neighbors. That's it. That's all I have to do. Well, Jesus starts and answers and says this. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothes and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his womb, wounds and pouring in the oil and the wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day... When he departed, he took out two denarii, which was, a denarii is one week's worth of salary. So he didn't take out a little bit of money. He took out two weeks' salary. He took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him? 
who fell among the thieves. And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Jesus said to him, go do likewise. I like to say, and Jesus said, duh. (laughs) So here we have a story of a guy who's in great need. He's hurt. We can, we can look at that emotionally. Who, has, who, who is in depression, who is going through a, a struggle in their relationship, who's been robbed from their joy. We don't have to look at, necessarily look at somebody who was held at knife point, stabbed three or four times, they stole their wallet. Okay, you can go there, but you can also look at anybody that is lacking in any way is your neighbor. So now I look around and I say, okay, who around me is my neighbor? Well, I know this person, their, their wife is going through uh, some physical difficulties, having some medical tests being run. Do they need attention? Probably. Well, this person just lost their job. Well, this person just had surgery. Well, this person's struggling with depression. Well, this person's kid's acting fool. Uh, now, all of a sudden, this opens all these doors. Now, I get to choose which of the three of the examples do I get to be. All right, the priest, learned, knows the word of God, walks by and sees the individual laying there dying and goes, oh, God bless you, son, and walks on the other way. Should know. I mean, he's been to cemetery. I mean, seminary. He's been to Bible college. He knows all of the stuff to know. He's astute in the Word of God. And he's busy. So then you have the Levites. The Levites were the ones that were the servants in the house of God. Wow. The servants in the house of God. He went. Tough day. And he kept going. So then came a nobody. You have to understand the Samaritans. The Samaritans were considered dogs. They were the nobody. They were from the wrong side of the track. They weren't even supposed to know the scriptures because the scriptures weren't for them. They weren't supposed to even understand the things of God. They were... Samaritans. They were the nobodies. But the nobody saw. And he went, God, I can't let this go. I'm going to bring him into my lifeboat. And when he stopped, he bandaged his wounds. He gave him medicine. At that point, he could have gotten up and said, hey, buddy, God bless you. You're saved now. Everything you need is here within walking distance. Now go. See ya. And it was good that he stopped and he shared what he had, right? He could pat himself on the back. We could go back into church and say, hey, I witnessed this week and he got saved. And you go, where is he? But no, he didn't stop there, did he? He picked him up and put him on his own animal. In his form of transportation, he brought him into his lifeboat. And he took him to the end, his place of safety. We could say he brought him to church. And he doctored him. He took care of him. He invested in him. He was mentoring him. Now, he was going to go away for a while. So he said, hey, listen, i got to go away for a while, but I'm going to leave you in the care of this guy. And he gave him two weeks' worth of salary. He was willing to invest what he had earned in this man. And not only that, he said, listen, if you spend more than this, I'll be back. I'm going to check on you. And when I come back, I'll help you, and I will pay whatever it is that it took more to take care of you. So what he said was, I'm willing to invest in you and be with you the long haul. The long haul. There, there, there's a time coming in, to, in the society we live in today where we've got to be willing to invest in people for the long haul. 
Because it's not enough that we just take and, and they come to, to Christ and we share our faith and, and, and all of those things. But now we have to have enough in us that we have something to give. That means I need to be studying. That means I need to have a closer relationship with God. My relationship with God has to be strong enough that when I do witness to somebody and they do get saved and they say, okay, now what do I do next? I don't have a clue. Apostle Paul said, you see me do it, you do it. Jesus said, go do likewise. So what we're doing is we say, okay, Simon, this guy gets saved. He comes to church with you. He's with you. He say, what do I do next? He said, just do what I do. Are we at that point when our relationship with God where it's okay for me to just do, say, hey, uh, go do what Simon's doing. Or hey, do what I'm doing. Just do what I do. You go with me, you follow me, we do these things, and, and you just do what I'm doing, and you'll be fine. Are you okay with that? Is your relationship with God enough and in the place that you can say, just be, be like me? Because that's what discipling is. You're mentoring somebody. When you're working with the scouts, you're saying, I'm going to teach you how to be a productive citizen. I want you to behave like I do. Yeah. When we're working in the children's ministry and we're teaching them scripture and we're teaching them all these things, we want to say, I want you to behave like I do. But what happens is we do this. <clears throat> we say, well, you need to memorize scripture. Well, like what? Well, I'm not sure. Let me... What should you be doing? Memorizing scripture. Oh, well, I can't memorize things, pastor. You don't understand. Do you know your birth date? Hmm. How many of you can remember the address of the house you grew up in when you were a kid? How many of you can remember your landline phone number? I can remember my one from back when I lived in Laurel Valley when I was in fourth grade. I have the ability to memorize. Well, how do I know those numbers? Because even my school teacher said you have to memorize your phone number for safety purposes. You need to know your address in case you get lost. Well, guess what? You need to know the Bible for safety purposes in case you get lost. In case you're in need, you need these scriptures. In this Christian life and witnessing course, they've done it a real good way. They say to you, you need to memorize some scriptures so that whenever you're out there ready to witness to somebody, they have this little perforated sheet here in the back. And they have um, six scripture verses. All right, they're not big, they're not long. But you rip those out and they're like flashcards. You guys remember memorizing your times tables? I think everybody in here is old enough to have done that. They don't do that anymore. But, you know, you memorize your times tables. What did you do? You made flashcards. If, if you were a wealthy family, you bought them. If you weren't, you sit down with a box of crayons and cut up paper. You made flashcards. For what purpose? Repetition. Well, guess what they did for your scriptures? They made flashcards. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's not very long, is it? Why do I need Christ? Well, Romans 3 said, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why you need Christ. See, and we, we have a boom, boom, boom. We need to know the scripture. And then when I encourage him, I sit down with him, I say, we need to memorize the scriptures together. You need to read the first three chapters of the book of John. Why? Well, I don't know. That's what I was told to do when I got saved. <laughs> because the book of John is the love book. He was the closest to Jesus as far as in his love relationship with Christ. He loved Christ so much that he laid his head on his chest. The relationship he had with God was just based in this overwhelming love. And Jesus loved him so much. 
Even so much that on the cross, he said, John, do me a favor, take care of my mom. Well, I don't know why you should read the book. Of, so why don't we do it together? I'll tell you what, I'll meet you Tuesday night at the coffee shop. You can buy me coffee and we will. That's what friends do and it's your turn. All right. And we go through the process and we continue to pour in and we continue to pour in and we continue to pour in. It's one of the things I've challenged Etiquette at this year. I've challenged myself this year is to take one or two people and start to mentor them. <laughs> so I have a couple of people that I look at and say, listen, I want you to buy this book. And every week on this date at this time, I'm going to call you. We're going to spend, we're going to spend 30 minutes together talking about this book, how it applies. And then, you know, I'm going to look at them and say, now go do likewise. I want you to find one or two people that you can invest in, that you can mentor. Well, I don't know anybody. Well, then get somebody. Get that friend that sits next to you at the table or at your desk and say, do you know Jesus? No. Well, get saved. Now what do I do? Well, every day at lunch, I want you to read this, and I'm going to read it too, and we're going to sit down and talk about it. How long do you do it? Yep. You keep going. You keep going. I have people that I started mentoring years ago that I'm not meeting on a daily basis, but still when they need something, who do they come to? Me. I have mentors in my life that literally in my life became my mentors when I was a preteen. They spoke into my life. They worked on me. So I've told you guys about them before. And even today, when there's things that happen in my life that I don't know how to deal with, I pick up the phone and I say, Larry, help. Why? Because he invested in my life all that time. This is what being a Christian is really all about. Being a Christian is not about you. You're already saved. As they said in the old days, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. <sighs> Got to drop the shoulder a little bit when you say that, Anna. Now God says, now give what you got. Because what you got is phenomenal. You have the best gift in the entire world. Don't keep it to yourself. There are people literally everywhere around you drowning. They are drowning. If you don't have it around you, come ride with me for a few minutes. I can take you to some places. Robert can take you to some more. There's places we can go. We don't have to go overseas to find issues. You don't have to row far. Some of us don't have to leave our own house to find those that need Christ. We don't have to leave home. But that's the hardest place to witness because when I look at them and say, be like me, whew, they get the me without the good hair and makeup. <laughs> Hallelujah. They get the pre-coffee me, you know. They, they get the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the uglier. You know, they get all the, thank you, uh, Alex is okay. Are you all right, Alex? Everything's still there? Okay. Whew. Hey, Mike, make him a cap that goes over that. So I thought we were going to have to raise the dead for a minute. <laughs> it's all right, buddy. And don't erase that from the tape because I need everybody to see it now. The whole process is I've got to be willing to bring people into my lifeboat, my place of safety, and give them what I have. At what level I am. Because when I start giving what I have, God will replace it. And I'll grow. One of the best challenges for me is the fact that I have to stand here and preach. You know what that does for me? Every week I have to challenge myself to study more. Why is that? Y'all smart people. There are some, some spiritually astute people that, that know the Bible. 
And they'll know instantly if I'm somewhere I shouldn't be. And most of those are not afraid to share that with me. You know, that's where I miss mama. My mother, every Sunday, Anna, she would walk to the pulpit and she'd say, Douglas, you know I love you. And she'd break out her list. <laughs> and she'd say, you said this wrong. You mispronounced this. The slide should have had a comma here. And, well, that's old way of doing it. They've changed that to a semicolon now. And, and <sighs> But believe it or not, I miss it. But see, the fact that I have to speak to you every week challenges me. And when you start giving away what you have, you're going to say, oh, wait a second, I have to meet with them on Thursday. Do I have anything to give? I better read my book. You know, we've been talking about, and I keep telling you that I haven't been to the gym the way I should be. I still haven't been to the gym the way I should be. Michael started back at the gym. So when you see him, just give him a little tap. He'll thank you. Um, but here's the thing. If I know that Dan is waiting for me at the gym, I'm going to go. Because I want Dan. If I know that I'm going to meet with Dan to discuss the book, guess what I'm going to do? So not only is it good for the person that I'm mentoring, the person I'm working with, it's good for me. Because there's that level of accountability, and now we have accountability one to another. And now, because I'm telling you, can I be really honest? Hello. Uh, If I can be really, really honest with you, there are times that I do not want to study. I don't want to prepare a sermon. It's the last, Steve, it's the last thing in the world I want to do. The only thing that even saved this week was the Mountaineers got beat so badly I had to shut it off. I mean, there's times that I just don't want to. And I go, whew. I gotta, I gotta preach in a couple days. It would be really bad if we got up and sang a song and say, "Hey, love you guys, got nothing." But I appreciate you coming. See, you, let's go have a potato. Some of you would go, "Thank you, Jesus." But truth, uh, truth. I mean, honestly, there are times that I don't. But the accountability that I have is, I know there are going to be people sitting here that are expecting something. And I go, okay, God, we got to do something. Help. And then there's times I'm in it so much that, man, I just, I got so much I could preach for a month and my studies are really great and everything's going really good and everything. And then I get to the point, I'm like, I got to do something with this. I got to do something, I got to do... I got one that's burning in me so badly right now that I'm going, and God said, well, you've been waiting to write the book. Write the book. So that's what I'm doing. I guess this was burning in me so much I have no place to put it. I'm putting it on paper. And you guys know how much I like to talk? Thank God they added talk to text to Word. I used to have to buy the software to do it. Now I just have to hit the little microphone in the upper right-hand corner. Click. And then I have Lauren that I can send it to and say, hey, fix the punctuation in this and make it decent. Thank you, Lauren. She doesn't know it yet. but This is a good way to break those into your daughter because she's less likely to say, bah. Less likely. She'll do that later. There are things that are inside of you that you need to give to somebody, that you need to mentor them with. And you say, well, I don't have... It may be your work ethic. Don't go dig the ditch by yourself. Call somebody. Even though you can dig the ditch by yourself, you can do it. You don't need anybody to help you. But they need to help you. I'm cleaning this Saturday. I'm cleaning my house this Saturday. Bring somebody over to clean your house this Saturday. Do you need help? Nope. But it's embarrassing. I'm well, not talking about you, Lauren. We know you always need help. It's, it's embarrassing. You know, it's like you, when you run the kids around. They, uh, my mom used to say, we were always going to get a maid. 
She said, if I could ever afford a maid, I would have a maid. But the problem is she would make us clean the house before the maid went over because she would be embarrassed on how the house looked. They're coming to clean. But listen, this is what we need to do. This is what mentoring is. Living Christ in front of them. Hey, I'm going to wash my car today. Why don't you come over? And while we're washing the car, I can look at you and say, so how's it going? What's, what's going on in your life? What's God telling you? Wax on, wax off. We got dirt to move. Here's a shovel. So what God saying to you? This is mentoring. This is investing in people's lives. Bring them into your lifeboat. Bring them into your lifeboat. So as we move forward, we have the dates up here. If you guys would take one of these for the Christian life and witnessing classes. So much of the material I'm teaching right now is coming right straight from the Christian life and witnessing classes. Three weeks of investment, one night a week for three weeks that I promise you will change your life. Promise you it'll change your life. You say, oh, he's just been there. Nope. If it doesn't change your life, come back and tell me I will, inv- I'll, I will reimburse you for your time. That's how much I believe in it. Somebody will test me. But you go and you mark your calendar and you say, I'm going to set these times aside. There's every night of the week, there's a class somewhere. So you can say, I'm busy. Listen, every night of the week for three weeks, there's a class somewhere. Morgantown, Fairmont, Buchanan, Bridgeport, Weston, Meadowbrook Road, pretty well covers it. Somewhere you can get to within a stone's throw. It's worth your investment. Okay? So I want you to take one of these with you. Mark your time. Plan on it because here's what happens. Oh, I'll go to one of them. No, 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 no. Mark it on your calendar. Put it in the Google with an alarm. Okay? You need to be here. You need to be here. Those of us who are volunteering at the the, uh, celebration, we have to go. We don't have a choice. To be a part of anything in the celebration at all, you have to attend these classes. It's their requirement. Now, am I looking at you and say, you have to be there? Nope, but I'm strongly recommending it. Still your choice. But I would love to see you invest in your life. You say, well, what about my kids? They can come to these. These are going to be a little more adult-centered and heavy. Or they can spend a whole day on Saturday out at Trinity Assembly of God in a more party-like atmosphere, but still learning the same information. Okay? So, across the board. And that's from middle school age, all right, all the way up through. Okay? And we're not announcing it yet, but I'll tell you guys the same thing. If you can't make all of these, you can do the Saturday one. You just sign up as a chaperone and you'll be there the whole day. All right? All day long, but you'll still get credit for going to them. Okay? So if you want to attend with your kid instead of sending your kid and dropping them off because you don't trust us, (laughs) you can do that. Okay? It's time for us to start looking. Those of us, you guys should have your bring a friend flyers. If you don't, there's some there or there's some in my office to help you look at. This is some of the things we're going to go over next week to help you look at who can I start thinking about? Who can I start investing in? And you don't have to wait all the way till April to bring somebody. It can be right now. You can start and you can say, Steve, you know, you got somebody in mind. You say, hey, buddy, I'm going to pick you up Sunday morning. I'm going to take and get you to breakfast, and we're going to we'll bring you to church with me. 
Well, I'll feed you first. And we start investing in that time. Now, if all you ever do is talk to them about going to church with you, they're going to get tired of you. But you also got to look at them and say, hey, I'm getting ready to do some work at the house. Why don't you come over? Hey, I got, well, I'm watching a game. Why don't you come up and watch a game with me? February 2nd, Super Bowl. We're having a Super Bowl party here at the church. Woo-woo. Great time to invest in people. Men's breakfast. Women's Friday night Bible studies. Great time to invest in people. So start looking at the opportunities you have. But here's the problem. And I'm going I'm to quit preaching and we're going to go eat. The problem is we're not investing our own time. We're not at women's Bible study. And we're not at men's breakfast. And we're inviting people to come to things that we're not willing to do ourselves. I'm asking you to not only invest in people, but invest in yourself. You can't give what you don't have. It's called spiritual discipline. That's another sermon for another day. Amen. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I thank you for the challenge of the Great Commission that tells us to go, to make disciples. So Lord, as we look at these trainings, as we look at these opportunities to learn to be a better disciple ourselves so that we can make disciples, Father, so we can reproduce ourselves. Lord, in each one of us, bring people to our minds that we should be reaching out to. Put people in our paths and let us be like the good Samaritan that won't step over them and keep going, but will stop and will pour in the oil and the wine, Father. The kind that restores the soul. Lord, I submit all to you that was said today. And Lord, I ask that you would add your blessing to the word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.